Well, we can go ahead and get started. Judge Campbell should be joining us any minute, um, but we can start out with our introductory um, info about the webinars and whatnot. But thank you everyone for being here with us today. Um, this will actually be our final webinar of the year. During December, we are going to take the month off um, so that we can let everyone have time with their families if you need more time and um, you know get ready for the holidays and all of that. So um, we will be picking back up in January with um, bi-weekly. In, in January, we'll start with bi-weekly webinars. Oh, and here comes Judge Campbell now, great. Um, you're seeing her in the background with her judicial assistant, Chris Ford, who's a good friend of mine. Um, but we'll pick up with the bi-weekly webinars in January, and um, we'll be excited. We'll send out information to those of you that are on our email list. I think everyone in this group should be. Hi, Judge Campbell, how are you? Hi, Melinda, how are you? Doing well. Thank you. How is the family? Doing really well, thank you. How are you doing? Good, I like your hair, it's a bit longer. Thank you, yeah, it's grown a lot. It's partly because I can't get into my hairdresser <laughs> during this time, but we'll, we'll well, go it with it. Good. It looks good. <laughs> well, you look great as well. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you for asking me. Yeah. So this week, for those of us, for those on the call, we are continuing to talk about judges and the courts for our November theme. Um, for those of you that have been following the news, the, the courts have been front and center in many different areas of our life right now. And so we think this is a timely topic, but um, we shared, I'm gonna share my screen here for a moment. Um, let's see. We shared this graphic, maybe it'll come up. There we go. Can everyone see that graphic? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. We shared this graphic two weeks ago when we had appellate court judges um, on our webinar. So last two weeks ago, we had um, judges from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. We had Judge McHugh. We had um, Justice Paige Peterson from the Utah Supreme Court and Judge Jill Pullman from the Utah Court of Appeals. So we described this chart two weeks ago, but just to review, in our state and throughout the country, we have parallel systems of courts that handle different types of cases. Um, on the federal side, so our national courts, we have our US district courts, which are the trial courts, along with the specialty courts. And today we're covering that level of courts, the trial court level. And we have um, Judge Tina Campbell on the call, who is a representative from our um, U district of Utah, the um, United States District Courts for the District of Utah. And I will also mention that I had the great opportunity to work with Judge Campbell as one of her clerks. So um, it's really great to see her. Um, it's been quite a while actually. So I'm happy to see her at least via Zoom. Um, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> on the state side, we have a uh, maybe a couple extra levels of, of process in there. On the state side, we start out with our justice courts, which handle misdemeanors in the criminal side and the lower amount civil suits um, on the civil side of things. And we have with us today, Judge Clem Landau, who's a judge on the Salt Lake City Justice Court. We're happy to have um, Judge Landau with us as well. Hi everyone. From, yeah, from there, we go up to our state district courts. We also have um, state juvenile courts and we opted to focus on the district courts at this time. And that's our trial courts for for the state and um, with us, we have Judge Jennifer Brown, who's in the fourth district court for the state of Utah, which covers, um, I hope I get this right, Utah, Wasatch, Juab and Millard counties, is that's that correct? correct? Okay, yes. I did check that beforehand, so I'd try and get that right. Um, so each of our, we have groups of counties that are covered by our different district courts and, and Judge Brown covers that area of our state. Um, and as I said, we had the appellate court representatives talk about their work last time. And so we're excited to have the trial court judges with us today. Um, I guess I should also mention that last week we had an event where we honored and paid tribute to Justice Ginsburg, um, who passed away a couple months ago. And so if you're interested in watching that, if you couldn't join us, that's on our website as well. Um, 
So with that, I, I told you who all of our participants are and in the tradition of our webinars, I'm going to allow each of our judges to do some self-introduction and explain why or why it was that they chose to go to law school in the first place and the, jo the jobs they've had as they progressed to where they are now. So um, let's see, let's start with Judge Campbell. Judge Campbell? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I'm Tina Campbell and I'm a senior judge. That means um, that I am semi-retired and by that I take 50% of the cases. I don't take 100%. And there are a lot of senior judges over here. I think we have, what, six, Ms. Ford? Like that. We have more seniors than we have um, regular judges. We're a sturdy lot. And we're, I just take all sorts of cases. Uh, I started out as a teacher. I was a French teacher, um, which has been ab absolutely of no use to me whatsoever, other than I've learned how to say word dire in a way that's wrong. Um, and I went into the law because uh, I couldn't get a job anymore as a teacher when they cut down the emphasis on languages. And I became a prosecutor for several years and now I moved, then I moved into being a judge for 25 years and uh, I'm glad I did. Great, thank you so much. We'll dive into that a little bit more in a moment, but um, Judge Brown, why don't you tell us about your path? All right, well, um, I first announced that I wanted to go to be a lawyer. I didn't know what that meant, but I first announced when I was in fourth grade. And um, I thought, and, and it turned out to be true, thankfully, I thought that um, becoming a lawyer would be a, a way for me to um, have a voice, not just for myself, but for others. And so um, I, uh, I went a roundabout path. I didn't go straight out of high school into college or to law school, but the desire to go to law school never really left me. And so I ended up going um, to law school when I already had children. My children were nine, seven, and four when I started law school. And uh, I came out um, and went into practice uh, doing what's called civil litigation. So um, lawsuits uh, generally between companies, you know, rather than individuals. Um, and I didn't ever really think I wanted to be a judge. I didn't, I hadn't thought about it until I became a lawyer. And I realized the impact that good judges and bad judges can have on the outcome of a case. And I decided that um, it was something that I wanted to pursue because I really hoped to be a good judge and be able to have an impact on the cases in front of me. Oh, I will just say, um, I don't know that Judge Campbell really recognizes me directly, um, but I did have the opportunity to work with her late husband, Gordon. Oh, um, where and how? Um, I was at um, La Bufflam, Green and McRae. Okay. I became maybe Murray, and he came in and was working with Ronald Wrencher and Mark Dykes, and I was um, working with them as well. And so I actually have a... a an autographed copy of uh, his book that he had published. And uh, I'm a proud owner of that. Well, thank you so much. He liked working in that firm. He loved Ron. Yes, he was, it was, those were very, very fun days for me um, to work with such quality attorneys. I feel very fortunate that I had so many people who mentored me and I think it's part of why I was able to get to where I am now. Yeah, he was fun, wasn't he? He was. <laughs> um, thank you so much for sharing that. I think um, hopefully one thing that comes out of these webinars for our attendees is that the Utah legal community is pretty tight knit and we try to take care of one another. And um, you find these connections that you never knew existed as you progress through your career. So it's really, I think it's a really beautiful thing, but. 
Um, Judge Landau, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be where you are? Sure, I'll dust off the speech. I haven't given this one since my last interview, probably a couple of years ago. But I, I, I graduated from college thinking I was going to be a doctor. So I went and uh, became a paramedic and drove around the streets of Boston, picking people up and doing a lot of uh, rough medicine, as uh, you usually do in the field at midnight and revere when people are shooting at each other and it really didn't um float my boat uh and i think in part because i was just mainly inter interfacing with er docs healthcare was changing at the time and they were all very very bitter people and so i thought well hell with this i'm not going to do this and um and I think that I had never considered being an attorney, um, but I married someone that was, I had always dreamed of being an attorney and went to law school right when I really didn't know what else to do. And she kept coming home with mildly interesting things, more interesting than what I, I was still working for a company in Germany, translating catalogs and doing other things. And I thought, well, this is kind of a, um, this was very much, uh, I think the, the spirit in 20, 30 years ago, if you really didn't know what, you, what to do, you went to law school and it just kind of gave you a Bachelor of Arts Plus and it allowed you to do all these things. I think that uh, dynamic has changed a little bit um, over, the, over the past couple of decades. So much has changed. And, um, and then went to law school and didn't really um, think about being a judge at all. Uh, worked at uh, some firms, read Gordon's book, by the way, with my wife. Um, and also, again, Judge Campbell, um, I clerked for Judge Benson. So whenever Judge Campbell had a jury trial, we would wander over there and watch some of it. And it was always a blast to uh, hang out. I don't know that um, that you remember me, Judge, but- uh, You uh, look awfully familiar. I thought you were either a judge or a law clerk or someone I'd sent to prison. I couldn't decide what. Yeah, well, um, we haven't checked all those boxes yet. And I hope to leave that final box unchecked. But um, yeah, so we had, we overlapped at the old district court building. Um, and then I went and uh, clerked in the 10th circuit as well. And then I was working in law firms. And it's one of these things that happens as you um, evolve through your career as a lawyer, you start really doing things that you think, well, this isn't, this isn't what I always imagined doing. I'm in these complex litigation projects and surrounded by people that are 50 times as rich as I am and have all kinds of problems. And, um, and sometimes it's really stimulating servicing those people. And sometimes you think, well, this isn't, this isn't really what I always dreamed of. And I had a moment like that four years ago and, and decided, well, someone reached out to me and said, hey, would you consider becoming a justice court judge? And I said, I have no idea what a justice court, ju what, what a justice court is. Never practiced in one, have no idea. And so I looked into it and it was, it was something that I thought would, um, would be fitting. And, and kind of it, it has brought it full circle because it's really back to uh, paramedicine for me. I've started my working life uh, as a paramedic doing all this quick medicine and trying to help as many people out as, as I can. And now I'm at the level of court that is really similar to that. We do all the small claims work and we do 70% um, of the workload in terms of cr uh, crimes. Um, and, uh, you know, if anyone has, an, has a brush with the criminal justice system, it's, it's probably going to be in a justice court somewhere in this state. And so I thought that was very important to um, to dedicate myself to that level of court. And it's been a it's been a fabulous experience so far. So uh, thanks, Melinda, for reaching out. And, yeah, uh, lucky to be a part of this group. Thank you so much for joining us. I love hearing the different paths that people have had to get to the law. And the the other interesting aspect of the law that I've found really fascinating is the number of um, attorney marriages that happen, you know, where there's dual, dual attorneys, three of us, I don't know about you, Judge Brown, but three of us on the call are married to attorneys. So there you have it, 75%. So on this call, um, but, um, both Judge Brown and Judge Landau kind of hit on why they decided to become a judge. Um, Judge Campbell, will you address that for us? What, what made you want to be a judge? Sure. I had been a prosecutor and I was in the federal system uh, for 14 years. And I can remember I was sitting at uh, my kitchen table, reading the paper, eating a bowl of cereal. And I saw that Judge Bruce Jenkins was going senior. And I knew there were no women federal judges in our district. There were none, zero. 
And I thought, hmm, well, maybe they need one. And so since I was in the federal system and I knew um, people in the federal system and I happened to know the senators because I'd been in the federal system so long, I just uh, gave it a shot. And I think I was such a novelty that uh, President Clinton chose me. And that's, that's what happened. Great. Um, for those on the call, there's a slightly different process for every court as to how one becomes a judge um, and gets chosen to, to fill those positions. And um, actually, maybe now's a good time. Uh, judge Campbell, you just hit on, on a little bit on your process. Maybe we'll just pick up on yours again. What's the process to become a federal judge? The process is you're selected by the congressional delegation. And it was uh, primarily um, Senator Hatch, <clears throat> who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the uh, Senate, and um, then Senator Bennett, who was our other senator. And I interviewed with them. And I had had the good fortune or whatever of prosecuting a case when Senator Hatch's mother um, was, I think she was stalked, but in some way it was a very nasty experience. So I tried the case <clears throat> and got it. So there was a pretrial diversion and Senator Hatch's mother didn't have to testify. And so um, I had that experience with him. And it was just very, there were no set criteria. It's just, I happened to get lucky. <laughs> And I think uh, from what I hear anyway, the federal process is much more, you know, the maybe not luck, but because you're definitely qualified, but there's much more happenstance to it sometimes, but. Oh, yes, we're, so, we're unfortunately more political than we should be. And that's showing right now, but yes, it's very definitely in a political um, affair and it shouldn't be but it is. Yep. Um, so Judge Landau, why don't you tell us how the justice court judges are chosen? And it, there, it, there's a nominating commission that does a series of interviews you put in for it. You, uh, you know, all the positions are posted on the AOC's website, the administrative office of the courts. And then uh, the nominating commissions forwards a few names uh, to the that either county mayor or the city's mayor, in my case, it was Mayor Jackie Biskupski. And, uh, and then you have another round of interviews with that person. It's, um, you know, it's not political in the way that Judge Campbell described in the federal process, but it's still political. It's still, you know, you got to find someone that likes you and thinks you'll be a good judge. And that's, you know, whether that's political with a capital P or political with a small P, you just have to find people that, you know, go to bat for you and then you get picked and then you can do the job. That's pretty much what my, you just have to find someone who likes you yeah. Yeah. And, and thinks for some reason you can do the job. So <laughs> I think there's great similarity there. Judge Brown, would you add anything on the district court level? So it's a similar process. It's just at a different, uh, you meet with different people on the district court. So there is a nominating commission for that as well. And they pick names that go to the governor for the state of Utah. And you meet with the governor's staff and then you also meet with the governor. And then if you are selected um, to be a judge by the governor, then you have to go through the confirmation process uh, with the Senate. So. Um, so you get that call from the governor and you have that really wonderful moment of, oh, I've been chosen. And then the sinking feeling of, I still have at least two more rounds to go between the, um, the judiciary committee at the Senate level and then going to the full Senate for confirmation. So, okay, thank you. Um, let's shift a little bit now. And I should also add for those um, attendees, feel free to um, put any questions you have in the Q&A or you can send them directly to me in the chat and I will ask those of our panelists and the judges while um, we're on or you can save them for the end either way. Um, but one question that we had um, from our interns in advance was um, to describe the work that your particular court does. So, or what types of cases your court sees. 
Why don't we start with Judge Landau on this one? Okay, we'll start in the basement. Um, so again, infractions, class Bs and class Cs, the more serious uh, cases that we have are DVs, assaults, DUIs, that kind of thing. Um, the work that we do is, um, we, is we're a high volume court. So traditionally, and this is before the pandemic, we had fairly large cattle call calendars um, where people would have to wait for, uh, hours to get their case called and then we would would do what we can and move it along and now it's all on webex which is has been pretty invigorating it's i think a great uh access to justice issue so most people now don't have to have a full day off work just to have their um case called they can they can take a break while they're at the office and and hop on with me and so that's nice it's it's been a really intense year but there have been some silver linings and and we do um we do a lot of jury trials too there's there's less of a pressure on people to plead guilty um your dui sentence really isn't going to change much if if a jury says guilty or if, uh, if you plead guilty. So there's not that much um, pressure. So it's not like, hey, if you go to take this to trial, you're going to jail for 20 years and then the plea on the table is five. So you can, um, you can see how that process sometimes really works on people. And there's not, that, that risk isn't there at our level. And so we get to do, I think we generally do about 100 jury trials a year, which is, um, which is really satisfying because I get to interact with lots of citizens and lots of people that come in for jury service. And we, we get to do those trials. Um, you know, it used to be once a week. We haven't done a jury trial since March, but we, um, we all, each judge has about a backlog of 200, 250 jury trials right now. So we're, it's going to be a long decade. How many jurors do you have? We only have four jurors, four which, jurors. B which bodes well for the, the Utah Health Department is, is really comfortable with um, you know, bringing in panels of 20 and only having four because you can really distance and mask. And we even have a, a system where we can put that four person jury in the assembly room and they can watch everything on closed caption TV. Um, and so uh, we can, we feel like we can do those juries pretty safely, um, but we haven't been given the go ahead yet for obvious reasons. Wow. That is a heavy caseload for um, attendees that you may not have context for that, but that's a lot of jury trials in a year um, and a lot of cases to be handling. Um, Judge Brown, how does your um, caseload differ? So I end up with um, criminal cases that are more serious in nature than Judge Landau. Um, so class A misdemeanors and felonies come to my court. That doesn't mean I don't see some of the same things as he does. It's just that um, usually when I see them, they're, they're kind of attached to an, um, more serious charges. So if somebody could get a third degree felony criminal charge and also have marijuana in their possession, so they have a class B misdemeanor and it just goes along with the more serious charge and I hear them all. Um, in addition to the criminal cases, though, I'm what's considered a court of general jurisdiction. That means pretty much anything that isn't carved out to the juvenile court or to the justice court, I see. So it could be um, adoptions, divorces, um, landlord-tenant evictions, um, people suing one another over a boundary line dispute or water rights, or I mean, just about any kind of legal dispute that you can think of um, would fall within my court's jurisdiction. And so it's um, when I first became a judge, my presiding judge told me that the thing that I would love about the job would also be the thing that I hated about the job. And that is, you never get to a point where you've seen everything. <laughs> um, you think you've been doing this for a while and then all of a sudden a case will get filed and you have no idea um, really what the, the issues are and you have to do a lot of research. And so it's fun, um, but it can also be a little nerve wracking to think, okay, I, I, I haven't seen this before and now I have to figure it out. <laughs> that is amazing, like the variety of it all. Um, yes. Campbell, how does the federal court um, compare to what was just described? Well, you know, I think better than I do, but we're a limited jurisdiction. So I take uh, only when people ask me, what kind of cases do you do? I say, I take federal cases. And uh, so many of my cases I get through diversity jurisdiction. Those are civil cases. Uh, citizens of different states, different jurisdictions. 
and the amount in controversy has to be of a certain amount. And then um, criminal cases uh, are limited. There has to be some sort of uh, federal hook like um, bank fraud. I get a lot of bank frauds or any sort of fraud that uses the mails or the uh, telephones or now and again, a murder, uh, let's say on one of the Native American reservations. Um, so it really is varied. Um, uh, federal questions, I think of trademark and patent and um, it's, I think as general as my two colleagues have described. Yep. I think that's right. So for um, the attendees on the call, when we talk about jurisdiction, we're talking about the power that is granted to different courts and judges to hear different types of cases. So not every court can hear every type of case. And so we have to make sure that the case is in the right court to begin with. And so um, each of these judges ends up handling slightly different types of cases depending on their jurisdiction. Um, Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your um, views about your work. What are some of the pros and cons of your particular work as a judge in your court? Um, let's start with Judge Brown this time. Okay, well, um, some of the pros for me at least is that I actually really do enjoy working with people. I, I enjoy, um, some of the things that I get to do um, because they're very positive. Like I, I preside over what's called a drug court and where I'm helping people overcome addiction and um, deal with the, the legal nature of what their addiction has caused them to do, you know, by committing crimes. But I get to see them really make changes in their lives. And, um, and that's really satisfying to me. Um, some of the cons are that um, we do have heavy caseloads and, you know, sometimes it's hard to be able to uh, really give each case the attention that I, I think it deserves. And so I do my best to, to find that balance. Um, but, you know, I, I don't really have a ton of cons on my list because I love what I do. Um, it's just like any job. There, there will be things that we have to do that aren't as fun. There might be days that aren't particularly enjoyable, but overall, I really enjoy um, being able to be a judge. That's great. That's great. Judge Campbell, what about you? Well, I think the biggest pro is I always like the people I work with. Um, I get two law clerks per year, uh, very smart, very talented. You are a perfect example. Um, I always make sure that I have law clerks who are smarter than I am, or otherwise, why would I want them? And they do much of the writing. Um, the con is um, sentencing people. Um, I can't help people really when I sentence. And uh, as you know, the sentencing guidelines can be quite severe, although I don't have to follow them anymore. But federal sentencing is a harsh business. And um, I sometimes, in fact, today was a good day. That was an example of that. I send people to prison and I know they're not going to do well in prison. And I also know they're not going to do very well when they get out. And that's a big con. Right. It's a heavy load. Yes. Sorry, not to make light after that note, but I, as Judge Campbell was speaking, I came up with another con and that is she has two law clerks. I have one quarter of a law clerk. Right. <laughs> that's a con. <laughs> I am spoiled and Melinda is although she was one of my very best, I have to say, I have very smart law clerks who, who can write and think far better than I. So that's a big plus. Yeah, I, I for as long as I've known that our district, state district court judges didn't have clerks, I really strongly felt that that's 
a huge injustice for everyone oh, yeah. involved. But yeah, um, Judge Landau, what are your yeah. pros and cons, and do you have any resources that help with some of those, or don't, or that missing resources of that nature? I'm gonna I'm gonna win the clerk battle because I have zero clerks, um, and that we just spent the last couple of months uh, working with the law school to get us two uh, interns that are going to start next year, um, and and I think that's uh, fabulous. Uh, the uh, I'm gonna use them. the The legal issues that get raised at my level of court are just as as intricate and interesting. Um, and they're mostly neglected because if you see on that chart, there's that line that connects the justice courts to the district courts. And then there's also another line um, that's a little bit misleading that connects the Utah state courts to the Utah Court of Appeals and the Utah Supreme Court, implying that anyone that had a case in justice court could somehow work their way up that whole ladder. And it's actually um, not quite true unless you have some constitutional issue that you can uh, bring up to the Utah Supreme Court, you're, you're done at the district court level and you're done with a, what's called a de novo appeal. So instead of um, looking at what I've done and giving me an opinion, um, as painful as it is when a district court judge gets an appellate opinion reversing them, that's also really important feedback to get so that you can do a better job on the next case. And I've never gotten that um, because when a district judge looks at one of my cases, they just decided a new, and then there's never a, a feedback loop back to my court. So um, anyway, that's all an aside. I, I enjoy doing and and. Um, and I'm back in a place in my career where I don't mind trying to, it's, it's I think also a con. Uh, I remember after clerking for my second year thinking, I'm so glad to be starting at a firm next year where I don't have to pick my way down the middle of every single legal issue. It's hard to pick your way down the middle. That takes a lot of effort. Um, it's really easy to just say, well, I got 10 cases that I like and 10 cases that I don't like, and I'm gonna be a persuader on why the 10 I like are rightly decided. Um, that's a fairly straightforward intellectual exercise. It's a whole lot harder to say, now I've got to give all 20 a careful read and pick my way down the middle. Um, and so after you know 10 years or so of, of being a persuader, I get to pick my way down the middle again. And, it's, and some days it's just really hard um, because you have to make sure that you're not, you, I get a lot of repeat players, so attorneys that I see all the time, um, and, and to a certain deg a degree, um, folks that I see all the time, and you have to just approach each case with the same freshness that you would if you'd never seen any of those before. And that's, that's just hard to do as a human. You form some biases pretty quickly, and then um, you can't let those bleed into what you're doing. Um, but I'd share what Judge Brown said in that the, the impact that we have on people is, uh, is breathtaking. And uh, the, the, the similar uh, court experience that I have is we run a homeless court out of the Wiegand Center in downtown Salt Lake City. And pre-COVID, we just go over to the shelter in plain clothes and, and just try to uh, take care of anyone that had a case, had a warrant out. We'd call their case. We'd, we'd um, usually have a prosecutor there live. We'd have some public defenders live. And we just kind of do what we can um, and again, that, that community is, is disproportionately affected by mental health uh, issues. And so it was always a big relief for people to see us and to have us handle their cases and, and try to get, hit the reset button for them so they could move forward. And, and, and a day like that, it's just, it's the luckiest thing in the world to be able to do that work. Um, and, uh, and so that's, you know, that's the pro. You can, you can see a lot of people and you can try to um, you know, the hard part, you know, sometimes you got to sentence someone where, you know, look, the evidence is that this jail time is not going to help you out. Um, but it's punitive. It's, it's, I've got a, I have some mandatory minimums that I have to enforce as well. And, and I got to do it. And, um, and you're not going to, you're not getting out of the cycle of mental health and addiction um, anytime soon. And nothing I do today is really going to have uh, changed that. So those are the hard cases, but the cases where you have an impact, those are the really satisfying ones. Thanks for sharing that. I think there's a lot of things in there that um, highlight things that judges do that maybe a lot of the public doesn't know about, um, like the homeless court and things like that. Um, I had a question come directly from to me that says um, on Judge Landau's point about, you know, starting to 
see the same cases and getting in routines, how do you stay excited about your work and keep that freshness? Maybe we'll start back with Judge Landau since you were the one that hit on that and then we can move around from there. I think part of it is just, I'm, I've only been doing this for two years. So uh, everything is still, especially cause we took this, this weird pause this year. And I felt like um, when I restarted doing hearings on WebEx, it was like, oh my God, I, this, I feel like I'm in judge school again and learning what I'm doing. And now not only do I have to make the legal rulings, but I have to be the telephone operator and tell people how to troubleshoot their internet and their audio. And I can see that you're, you know, there's so much. And then most of my brain was supposed to be spent figuring out the legal issue. And now I'm spending time just trying to figure out who are the 20 people in the meeting and who's got a case that's ready. Who's, oh, that's your client. I'm going to move you into a breakout and, oh, you can't figure out how to get in the breakout. Well, let me to call a timeout. You see that little red dot, you got to click on that and then you got to click on that. But I can tell that your, your internet's not so good. So what you need to do is turn off. Your, it's just a, a endless stream of stuff that I have to articulate now. Um, and so that's quite challenging. Where did, what was the initial question again? Oh, how do you uh, try to stay level-headed and fair? Yeah. And keep a fresh mind for each. Yeah. I, I do, st I do things where I, I try to, um, scare myself a little bit um, and keep it fresh. Like I try to not just read from a script, um, but, but in the moment, try to figure out new ways to articulate things based on, you know, I see that, uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to think of a new way to explain a jury trial, right? And, and I think that it's kind of scary because you don't, it's not just a rote thing that you're doing, but um, it's fresh. It, I think it comes across as fresher because you're not just saying the same thing every, every time. I did that in, um, in kind of jury trials in voir dire too, where, uh, you know, anyone that's familiar with uh, how juries work, we have instructions that are, that are really handed down uh, from uh, committees that have thought deeply about what needs to be said and what doesn't need to be said. And, um, and so, you know, when I came in at the beginning, I just, I just, I read the script so carefully that I once introduced myself as a different judge because that was the name of the judge that was on the script. Um, and I think as you get better at it, you can, you kind of back away and say, Clem, what are you doing here? You're reading this into a microphone and across the room, across the room, like 30 feet away, there are people just sitting there and they're glazing up because they are not listening to a word that you're saying because you're just monotoning it into the record. And so I would, again, in the spirit of scaring myself, just walk out and say, enough of this. I'm going to talk to you about, about the role of being a juror and being uh, unbiased and, and strategies for not being biased. And, I, and that's, that keeps it fresh because <coughs> it's scary. <laughs> Thanks for that. Judge Campbell, you mentioned um, in your intro, you've been doing this for 25 years this year, right? Or plus. Yep. Yeah. Over 25, 25 now. 25 years. So how do I, <clears throat> well, and that's the way I keep it fresh. It used to be when I went into court. I really liked seeing the people who were appearing in front of me. I liked seeing the attorneys. I liked hearing their arguments. I liked seeing the litigants. Um, it was the people that kept it fresh. And of course that is not possible now. Um, Zoom is as close as I get. And as you all know, it's just not the same thing. But when those people come in and they're, they are there, for some reason I can always relate to the fact that um, I might have been doing this for a very, very long time, but those litigants, this is a very special day for them. They have a very special problem, and um, I have to bear in mind the importance to them of what they're telling me and what I'm going to do, which is very much handicapped by COVID. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a challenge. Um, Judge Brown, do you have any tricks that you use to um, keep a fresh mind with each case? So the way that I um, try to keep 
uh, it in perspective is I, I try to think about the case from the perspective of the individual appearing in front of me um, because while this might now be getting a little bit more routine for me, meaning I see you know X number of cases every day, the person who's appearing in front of me, odds are that this is the most important thing that's happening in their life at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do see people who are, you know, um, they come in more frequently, right? And so they're a little more familiar with the legal system. But for most people, they're, they're, they're terrified, right? They, they don't know what it is that I'm going to do. Um, and, and so I have, I just remind myself that if I were the one standing on the other side of the podium, how would I feel? And, and so it reminds me that I need to be very, um, you know, patient. I, I need to be very um, willing to explain um, things that, that are easy for me, but, you know, might be completely beyond what, what they understand. And so I just try to remember to take it a, a look from their perspective. Great. Thank you. Um, and thanks for that question. Again, if others have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A or in the chat to me. That's fine, too. Um, your um, answers kind of maybe this is related and it will have a similar answer, but um, as a judge, you're meant to be impartial and objective. Um, how do you go about doing that when you are seeing such um, hard personal cases in front of you every day and dealing with individual people every day? Um, judge Campbell, what do you do to help with that? Well, <clears throat> there are certain cases that I have recognized for many years I simply cannot be impartial about um, certain uh, crimes against children. I cannot, and I I just recuse. Mm. I just pass it on because I know I cannot do that. Um, many child pornography I cannot do, if, particularly if they're of a certain kind. Um, others. Um, I don't know how I can be impartial. There are probably uh, attorneys who say I'm not, but I think I am. Um, I think I can be, although I'm certainly aware of the importance to the litigants and to a certain extent to the, to the attorneys, the importance of this case, um, I am able to step back and just view it as, as a bit afar, you know, this is their problem. Let me try and do what I can do for the very best, but I cannot take this hope with me. Right. Uh, Judge Brown, would you have anything different to add? Well, I will just say that um, it was probably the most difficult transition for me to make coming from practice and, and taking the bench. Because, um, you know, as an attorney, you're an advocate, right? You are, um, you're certainly arguing for a certain outcome. And um, moving to being now neutral and not swaying, not putting your finger on the scale, you know, for either side um, was actually really hard. And I, and I had, I, I felt like there were at least a couple of times where I was just boring a hole in the attorney's head by my glare that are you going to object, you know, because I can't object for you. Um, and so I really had to work on that and to understand that for our system to work the way that it is intended to work, I have to be neutral. I have to be unbiased because I believe in, in our system. I believe in the way that our, our justice system works. And so for me to play my part and to ensure that it's a fair, uh, it's a fair playing field for everyone, I have to remain in my, in my spot as the neutral arbiter and, and not move off of that point. Um, and so it, it's, it can be hard, but I, I firmly believe that um, for me to do the best job that I can for the parties is for me to stay in that position. 
Oh, you are on mute. <laughs> I got through almost the whole day without doing that. It was so close. Um, Judge Landau, how about you? Um, I, that's a, I think, so I've shared that experience with Judge Brown and, and I get, I've gotten to the point now where I tell my repeat players, I say, don't assume that anything I do, like if I look at you, um, just to, I'm, I'm not in the, I, I am not sending you a message as to whether to object or whether not to object. I'm just not in that business because it's become kind of an art form where attorneys are more interested in just watching the judge than actually just like, you're the author of this case and I'm, don't take anything I do on the bench. I may have just, I'm look, just assume I'm looking at something behind you. Um, don't let me interfere with that because that's uh, really important. Um, so that, you know, I, I see mostly the younger attorneys fresh out of law school trying their first cases. And um, I think maybe some, they're used to some judges at my level of court that basically just like to run the show. Um, and, and, you know, there's an argument that's, uh, maybe some a feature that's missing, um, especially when you have a pro se person on one side and and you have a judge who's absolutely well trained in the law, just staring at the back uh, of the room because they're saying, "I'm not going to get involved in this," and you're going to make 400 mistakes, and I'm not going to do anything about it. And you know, at some point, you get to a breaking point. But um, I'll, I'll I try to just follow the things that that I tell juries to do when it comes to being fair. And and one of them and and these are evidence-based strategies that uh, people have researched. And one of them sounds silly, but just to be humble. Um, if you have a, a kind of a, if you come to the process of judging from a place of humility and it's not about you and it's not about whether you seem like you know it all, that's fine. Um, I, I missed that, but I'm just gonna continue to be humble. And that actually makes your decision-making better. And then to go slowly. So if you notice that you're in a rush or you notice that you're, and, and this happens to me all the time, you know, you're emotionally triggered for some reason, maybe something happened at school or, you know, the last case didn't go so well and you look foolish because you said something that was actually completely not the way that sentence works. And, and you just have to say, look, I'm not going to engage in that part of my brain. I'm just going to stay um, uh, on pace and kind of take the emotion out of it and go step by step. And then the third strategy, and these are like, you know, ABA strategies for um, that you're supposed to uh, also read to jurors is to, um, to just be self-motivated, to be fair um, in everything you, you do. Just say, I don't care what else is going on. I'm, a, I'm actually motivated right now uh, to be as fair as I can in this case that's right in front of me. And that, again, also helps with any implicit biases that may be coursing through your, your brain. So I, try to, I tell jurors to do those things. I try to do them myself whenever I'm in that position of having to make a call on a case. Yeah, which is probably good advice for all of us in the day-to-day -day interactions we have, right? Um, I don't know, private practicing attorneys, they're most of them, um, I think, uh, don't make a living being humble. And that's <laughs> part of the shtick is that, you know, this guy's the opposite of humble and that's why I'm gonna hire him. He's a bulldog, he's a, you know, yeah. whatever. And, and so I think that's part of some people's calling cards. But I don't, if you wanna just be fair, I don't think that's a good way of presenting yourself. Right. Um, so I have another question that came into the chat to me. Um, it seems like all of you see cases that would be really difficult to hear and to handle, even if you can recuse from some of them. So do you have any self-care or other um, mechanisms that you use to take care of your own mental health? Um, why don't we start with Judge Campbell? Well, I probably need to take care of my mental health a little better. I don't know. Um, but I think, as I said earlier, that I try very hard to leave my work at home and not to think about um, the very sad things that, that we all see in court and um, Often I find that as soon as I get out of the courtroom, I'm saying to myself, oh, why did I say that? But I try to keep that to a minimum. And I think as both Judge Brown and Judge Landau say, you know, you give it your best shot and try to be fair, try to be impartial, but then you step away. 
Um, Judge Landau, would you add anything to that? And improve on that. That's perfectly said. Um, I think one of the things, and, and, and part of it is just always give your best effort, but then also don't mind at the end of the day. And so there's been some calendars where I literally say this at the end, I look up and I say, I can see that everyone's annoyed with me. And so I must have done my job today. And to not mind, to just say, look, I have to um, just just do my best every day. And, and, and knowing that, and then I can go home and say, look, I, I may have gotten it wrong, but I, I tried to get it right. Right. Uh, Judge Brown. Well, you know, I have to admit that um, it can get to me at, at times. You know, there have been a handful of occasions where I hold it together while I'm in the courtroom because I'm certainly trying to present, um, a, you know, a, myself as being professional and I'll leave and I'll go to my office and I'll cry for a little bit, whether it's, um, you know, <sighs> I mean, I've sentenced someone who who killed six people in a DUI accident and to listen to the families of those people who have been lost. It's it's almost impossible to sit there and and hear those things without it having a tremendous impact on you emotionally. And so, um, I, you know, I I have had to just kind of let you know, those emotions go in the moment. Um, but I also try my very best as, as um, the other judges have indicated to kind of draw that line of saying that it can't permeate every part of my life. I have to find ways to, um, you know, relax or explore. I, you know, I get massages occasionally where I think this is healthcare. It's not even a, a, a you know, a, a splurge. It's a, it's healthcare. And then, you know, just things that that we love or bring us peace. And and I'll just tell you, I, I introduced one of my coworkers to um to Melinda before we came on, and I'll show you the other one who's been sitting on my lap. This is Snoopy. And so he is, um, is that a small real enough. Dog? Yes, it's a real dog. What kind of <laughs> dog is that? A miniature schnauzer. And oh, that is a dog dog. <laughs> and he is, he is small enough that um, he will actually sometimes now crawl up on my lap and I'll, I'll have him in my lap as I'm holding court, which is I think a, a really novel new way of holding court because everyone should be holding a puppy while, while they're dealing That's with difficult cases. Right. <laughs> so, but it is important because burnout is real. You know, judges can um, experience it just like a lot of other high stress op uh, occupations. And so we have to be mindful of it and do what we can to find that balance. Thank you for sharing that. In our final minute or two, I, I like to close with this question for panelists. Um, we do have on the call and, and those that will watch the recording, mostly those that are considering law school and are thinking about whether to pursue a legal career. So do you have one piece of advice that you would give to people in that audience? Um, we'll start with Judge Landau for this one. Hope you're muted. I I know, I know. Okay, um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to go back to, uh, you know, my own story and staying true to who you are. Um, the, number one, you can do almost anything in law and, and kind of a sampling is, you know, my, my folks are from Germany and, and I'm a fluent German speaker. And when I first started at the firm, I was like, maybe I'll just join this international Law Society go to some of these conferences on German American law and become some civil attorney that represents a bunch of German companies. That sounds like a blast. And I think you can you can craft so many niches. You can be a First Amendment attorney, although that's really hard to do. Um, and you can you know you can do sports contracts. You can, there's so many things. Every business and and every nonprofit and every government agency that we have in our country and around the world needs attorneys to help them figure out. Uh, how to navigate important moments in their corporate lives. And, and so you can just about do anything, but whatever you do, you should, 
you should remember who you were before law school and, and kind of be true to that person. And I think that's when, you know, this transition for me really clicked into place when it, when I realized, look, this is something you're going back to another part of who you used to be. And, and this is, this is a great move. And I think that's the risk with law is sometimes you just get pigeonholed into things and like, oh no, you should sit in this chair. It's leather and you can represent all these people at your door and you can read through those 86 boxes. Um, and a lot of people love that kind of stuff. And if that's not you, and if you were a different person before law school, then you don't have to put up with doing that. You can find something that is perfect for you. But that's what's cool about law. I don't know, I don't, you can't, I can't think of another profession that has that kind of flexibility. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Judge Brown. Well, I would say um, I'm, I'm a fan of law school, obviously, because of how it has allowed me to uh, pursue my career. One of the things that I would suggest, it, and this is something I did, is don't go to law school with a preconceived notion about what it is that you're going to do. Um, take the opportunity to take all sorts of different classes. You might stumble onto something that you didn't even know about before, but that you find a real passion for. Um, I started law school thinking I would never be a litigator. I had worked in, in law offices. I had a not so great opinions of some litigators that I had worked with. And I thought, I'm never going to do that. Oh, yeah. Thankfully, I didn't foreclose the opportunity. I, I went through trial ad, I participated in moot court, all things that were um, experiences that I decided I wanted to have because I'd waited so long to get to law school, I wanted to explore every aspect of it. And it opened new doors for me that I hadn't um, planned on when I started. Thank you. Judge Campbell, do you want to round us out with your final bit of advice? What was the question? Um, what mm -hmm. bit of advice would you give to those who are considering law school? Well, no. Um, a lot of people get into law school and they find that it isn't the place for them. Um, and don't hesitate to leave the profession of law if you find out it isn't for you. I have a daughter who went to law school and she now teaches art history. So, you know, but I think maybe the training in law uh, helped her mind, helped her think, but certainly the practice of law was not for her. Right. So I think all of those things are really helpful to just keep in mind your options. You're never stuck in one place no matter where you are so um thank you all three of you for being with us today and thank you for those who joined us as attendees um as i said we'll resume in january and we'll be in touch with information about those webinars coming up um but please take care and enjoy the holidays even if we have to approach them in a new and different way so um we're really grateful to have all of you with us thank you so much <laughs>